Welcome, this is Ed Dominguez, and today we're getting wild with this guy, the Great Blue Heron. In 2003, Seattle, Washington, where I'm speaking to you from, adopted this beautiful bird as its official symbol of the city, the Great Blue Heron. And why wouldn't they? Standing four foot tall with a wingspan of six feet, there's nothing that's shy or retiring about this bird. It's all about size and extravagance. Take a look at the beautiful head with the white feathers, the beautiful gray steel blue of its wings and back. And if you're a little fish in the water, it's that long yellow bill that you're concerned about. For great blue herons are master hunters at waiting, watching, and striking. Great blue herons will eat just about anything their bill can catch. This great blue heron is typical of these birds being near waterways because they like to eat fish. But you'll also find them inland in meadows and even agricultural fields where they hunt for frogs, snakes, small mammals. Anything is fair game for the great blue heron. And with its long powerful bill, it's adept at snapping up prey, flipping it around head first, and swallowing it whole. Great blue herons hunt any time, day or night. This bird's out here in this waterway looking for a fish. Their typical strategy, stand absolutely still, look into the water with their powerful eyes, and when a fish swims by, strike with their long S-shaped neck. But great blue heron's eyes also are very good at seeing at night. They have a large concentration of rod cells, the cells we have that gather light and allow us to see in the dark. So great blue herons can be hunting 24 hours a day. It's the oddly contorted S-shaped neck that gives the great blue heron its speed and striking power when capturing its prey. In this illustration by Jen Lobo, you can see two of the special adaptations that allow the great blue heron to snap its neck in a whipsaw fashion. The trachea and esophagus leave the great blue heron's skull in front of the spinal column, just like in our bodies but then quickly wrap around behind the neck bones for the S-shaped curve, and then, as they enter the stomach, come back around to the front. This prevents the great blue heron from injuring either the esophagus or trachea when it makes a strike, say if an intervening branch were in the way. They're safely protected behind the neck bones. Also, the sixth cervical vertebra as you can see, is elongated and stretched like a letter S shape, which gives the neck the predisposition to have the coil, and then can lengthen instantly to strike. As an aid to keeping the feathers of the long head plumage and the breast in good order, the middle of the heron's three toes has a comb-like structure, which it uses to great advantage to make sure that all the feathers are in the proper place, properly aligned, and well-groomed. Another special adaptation of the great blue heron involves the long breast feathers that hang down. Now imagine you make your living catching slimy fish all day. Additionally, you're walking around ponds and marshes that might have pond scum, marsh oils, all manner of things that can foul your feathers. Well, the heron's feathers fray and fall apart at the tips, creating a powdery-like substance known as feather down. The great blue heron uses this down to great advantage by using its beak and its third toe comb to brush the down onto all of the greasy material from the pond or the fish where it sticks to that material 
and then falls away, keeping the breast feathers clean, well aligned, and helping in regulating the heron's body temperature. Here you can see a great blue heron carefully preening and using that feather down to remove any oils off of the breast feathers. One of the best aspects of observing birds is observing bird behavior. Look at this great blue heron and ask yourself, what's going on here? Sunbathing? Stretching? Even heron yoga? Actually, birds use the sun's ultraviolet rays to help rid themselves of pesky feather mites. And perhaps he's just enjoying the warmth. Maybe this heron just awoke from a nap. Check out this yawn. And of course, sunbathing can lead to overheating. Birds can't sweat, so they help cool themselves by panting, very much like a dog. Notice how the heron opens its bill, puts out its tongue, and rapidly breathes in fresh, cool air to help regulate its body temperature. Here's the same temperature regulation behavior viewed from closer in. Great blue herons practice colonial nesting, building their nests in a rookery high and tall trees in very close proximity to each other for safety in numbers. And just like the bird is big, so are the nests. They can average up to four feet in length and up to three and a half feet deep composed of sticks that the male brings into the female, who then weaves them into large baskets that festoon the trees. Great blue herons lay anywhere from two to six light blue colored eggs that are three and a half inches long. The incubation period takes anywhere from 27 to 29 days, and the young birds hatch with blue eyes covered in soft gray down. Compared to other birds, Young great blue herons spend quite a period of time in the nest, from one and a half to two and a half months, and their appetites are voracious. Imagine having to feed up to six hungry teenage herons like this multiple fish meals a day. The mother must feel like... <coughs> the adult herons display elaborate and touching pair bonding rituals, throughout courtship and nesting season. When one heron returns to the nest after a fishing expedition, they engage in a changing of the guard display, arching their necks, opening their bills, touching one another, and even loudly clapping their bills together, which people have described as sounding like two two-by-fours being smacked. So if you live near a great blue heron rookery, it's a noisy place. This wonderful clip was filmed by Aurora Santiago. But despite the intensity of these pair bonding rituals, they're short-lived. For herons practice seasonal monogamy, meaning that when the young have fledged and left the nest, the adults will return to their solitary lives and will pick a new partner for next season's mating. Basically, it's a case of hit the road, Jack, maybe see you around the marsh sometime. This is Ed Dominguez. The world of nature is waiting for you, so get outdoors, stay curious, and please hit subscribe and join me on our next adventure in the natural world.